Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I was told I should probably try to use the mic, but I don't want to blow out our speakers. I hope everybody can be able to hear me. I do have a way of projecting my voice, so hopefully that is contagious and get us all infected for 2014. Today, um, I want to kind of go back to last week first. Last week, Albert gave a message, and he talked about God's call to each of us. I hope you all remember that. It's on the Internet. If you haven't seen that message, go back and review the past uh, lessons that we had in our congregation here. But he talked about God's call for us. He wants, uh, God wants us to go and respond to his salvation. And he calls us to move and continue to move. And it's that last call that I want to kind of build on today because God's call for us to move kind of goes hand in hand with kind of what we're talking about today about God's love for each of us. So I hope in the next few minutes I can help direct our thoughts and our, our minds to the labor of love. And I'm mainly going to be focusing on 2014 because that's just right around the corner. And my aim today is to encourage everyone to get more involved with the work of God. We all need to get involved more with the work of God. And of course, as you've already heard, everything that we do should be in love. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, it tells us, For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for Him and how you have shown your love to Him by caring for other believers, as you still do. The New King James Version says that that is the labor of love. See, that is the work that is prompted by love. And as Christians, everything we do, everything we say, and everything we even think should be based in love. See, several passages refer to our labor as Christians. There's a lot of passages in the Bible that talk to the Christians about our toil and our work. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 8 and 9, it tells us that the one who plants and the one who waters work as one, but each will receive his reward according to his work. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3 tells us, in the presence of our God and Father, we never forget that your faith is active, your love is working hard, and your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ is enduring. See, so, since the Bible talks about the labor and the work of Christians, I want to take a few moments today so that we can talk about it as well. Let's talk today about our work and our labor of love. See, whenever you hear about the church's labor, the church's work. First thing that most people think about is the preacher's job, preaching the word, <laughs> teaching others. And see, this should be not part of only the preacher's job. This is every Christian's job to go out and teach others, to preach the word. It should be part of your lifestyle, to look for those opportunities that God presents to each one of us in order to tell others about the good news. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2 tells us, Preach the message. Be ready, whether it is convenient or not. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and instruction. Over in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus came to them and said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. In this passage here, it's talking about basically two ways that you can teach people. There's two different areas where you teach. You teach someone to become a disciple. You are training them to be disciples, to learn the, the word of God, and so that they can uh, obey it. Basically, you're teaching them to be a Christian. But see, the thing that the church often neglects is that second teaching there. After they have been, after they have obeyed the gospel, after they have been immersed into Christ, and they are now in Christ, we are to continue teaching them. We are to continue training. All of us need to continue in our training so that we can mature in Christ. See, we are to preach and teach the word at home. We are to preach and teach the word in our community. 
And we are to preach around the world. See, the New Testament church must be missionary minded. That's what the original church, the early church was. They went out everywhere teaching. We are to do the same thing. But see, pulpit preaching is not all like we sometimes think of the work. It's not only the work of the preacher to stand up on Sunday mornings and preach the word. See, some believe that that is only the preacher's job. That's why we're paying David, so let him go out and do the work for us. See, that's not the way it works. Every Christian is their duty to go out and preach and teach others about the good news about Jesus. It is every individual Christian who is responsible to influence others in the right direction in life. Everyone has a sphere of influence. You may not even know what your sphere of influence is, but you do have a sphere of influence. It may be in your job. It may be in your school. It may be just around in your community. But everyone has a sphere of influence that only you can reach. And it is your job to walk the walk and to talk the talk. Over in Acts chapter 8, after the, uh, the, the, the leader of that church at that time, one of the, the leaders, Stephen, was stoned. And the persecution began for the early church. It says in verse 4, But the believers who were scattered, they preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Wherever they went, they preached the good news. They continued on in perseverance. We need to do the same thing. We need, no matter where we go, we need to tell others. See, there was no professional class of preachers called the clergy, with the others called the laity. Every Christian has a work to do. Everyone has different talents. Everyone has different skills, and everyone has different interests. Those who could speak publicly, they did so. Some were better at teaching classes. And they, we see that over in Ephesians chapter 4. But see, all, no matter what their skills, no matter what their talents were, all were gospelizing. I'm not even sure that's a real word, but it works for me. They were all gospelizing. They were telling others about the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ and what he has done for each of us. Looking back at 2013, our family here had a great year. You just look around and we've grown. But see, we can't stop. We can't rest on our past accomplishments. Looking forward to 2014, we need to make sure every one of our family members here know how they fit into the family. And with everyone working together, we can make 2014 a year of revival for a Hawaii. But we all have to work together. Do you know what your talents and skills are? Do you know that your interests are needed here in this body? We need to put everyone to work and we need to use everything available to us. And it doesn't have to be something big or something we consider major. Are you good at organizing? Are you good at cleaning or just planning? Or are you good at preparing things? We can put that skill, we can put that, that to use here in the body. Everything that we have, we need to use. And we need to use everybody, old or young, girl, boy, all should be active in the body, working in love. See, there's more, though, than just preaching and teaching. It's more than just standing up here and, and, and pulpit preaching, so to speak. We also need to focus on outreach. We also need to focus on helping the needy. Galatians 6 and verse 10 says, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We need to look out for other people around our community, those in need. James says it this way, James 1 and verse 27, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for the orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. James only uses two categories of people in need at this time, the widows and the orphans, like we give uh, to Nobilius here. We also need to focus on our community around us. How many times do we see people in need every day around us? So many times in the past, uh, 
the United States especially, we, people kind of rely on, on their jobs and they have hope and, and faith in their savings account or, or their friends and their family. And, and lately, because of our economic situation, people have lost their jobs and lost their savings or lost their homes even. And they've lost their hope because of that. But see, we have a hope that is enduring and, and eternal. We have the message that we need to give to them so that they can stay in hope, in the right hope, the hope of Christ Jesus and what he represents for us. But see, that's not just for the congregation, that's for every Christian. We need to be on the outlook for people in need so that we can help those. But look at the last part of that verse there. See, God is also calling each of us to live pure lives. And that last part says, refusing to let the world corrupt you. See, it's so easy to fall back into the world. It's so easy to lose track of what's important. What we need to do is keep our focus on what we need to keep our focus on. And that is Jesus, our Savior. If we keep our eyes on Him, then we won't stray away. If we keep our eyes on Him and what He wants us to do, then we won't lose sight and fall away from what is important. Titus 2 and verse 12 tells us that God's grace, it trains us to avoid ungodly lives filled with worldly desires so that we can live self-controlled, moral, and godly lives in this present world. God wants us to live pure lives. So what can we say about preaching and teaching? First, we must preach. We must teach. Everybody must do this. Hebrews 5 and verse 12, it tells us, by now you should be teachers, but instead you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word. You need milk, not solid food. Are you in that category? Are you still requiring milk instead of the solid food of God's word? See, God does not wish us to become stagnant in our faith. He does not want us to be comfortable and stay in our comfort zones. He wants us to reach out. He, he wants us to mature. He does not want us to remain as babes. See, God desires for all of us to mature and grow daily. And as we continue to grow and mature, then we learn more about how to live those godly lives that God calls us to. And when we mature and we strive to live godly lives, then we will use every opportunity to help those in need. And then we can start to realize the truth that is found in Jesus' words recorded in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 is a beautiful passage that talks, that Jesus told us about the sheep and the goat, the righteous and the unrighteous. And in verse 40, he's talking to those on his right, the sheep. And the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. When we help others, that glorifies God. When we look out for others that are in need, that makes God happy. God blesses us so that we can turn around and be a blessing to others. Are you being that blessing to others around you? See, I hope you are. I hope you have set in your heart and your mind to be a worker for God. Because the laborers are few. Matthew 9 and verse 37 says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are are few. The field is ready for harvest. It's an abundant harvest. But there's not enough workers to go out in the field. There's not enough laborers. The harvest of souls is plentiful. But there's not enough to teach all those who desire to be taught. Even today, there's not enough workers going out to tell others the good news. See, in the past in the United States, we've had great shortages. We've had fuel shortages. We've had food shortages. But the church has a labor shortage. There's not enough workers to go into the field. There's not enough workers to go out into the workforce, into the schools, 
into your community and tell others about the good news that the world is longing to hear. Matthew 9 and verse 38 tells us what we can do. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. We are to pray. But I hope you realize that we cannot pray for laborers without knowing that we need to be laboring ourselves. When we pray for others to go out in the field, we're actually praying for ourselves to be part of that group going out. We all need to be workers going out into the communities, telling others. All Christians have the duty to pray that faithful laborers will go into the harvest to gather souls. But sadly, many do not put this high on their priority list. Sadly, because it doesn't pay very well. You don't get paid for going out working for God like that. It's not a monetary thing. And a lot of people are looking for that. Over in John chapter 4, Jesus was talking with the Samaritan woman. And his disciples returned and wanted him to, to eat. And over in John chapter 4, he says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me. And to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work. And you have reaped the benefits of their labor. See, the fields are white. They're white. They're ready. They're ripe for us to go into them. And the wages? Eternal life. Helping others receive God's free gifts. That's what we are to do. We are to go into our communities, into our schools, into our workplace, and tell others about the good news. Because we need to remember that this is a labor of love. We all must work in love. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3 says, As I pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the toil prompted by your love, says another version. See, the only reason anyone will labor for God throughout life is because of their love. The work of these disciples was a work of faith. See, our current work here in Hawaii is much different than the early church. See, if we teach and preach about God's love and His desire to have a relationship with everyone, the worst that can happen is maybe we get a door slammed in our face. Maybe someone laughs at us, or maybe they turn their backs on us. But the early church's labor of love could earn them imprisonment. It earned them torture and even death. But they were willing to continue to labor and suffer because of love. Love makes us willing to labor and suffer for those that we love. See, their patience was a patience of hope, an enduring hope of future blessings and joy that led them to bear with the persecutions, that led them out into the community even though they knew they could get tortured. Hebrews 6 and verse 10 says, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and still ministering to the saints. See, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. When we get discouraged, we often think that God has forgotten us. We get discouraged because others may not be listening to us. We may get that door slammed in our face. We may have friends say, you know what? I don't even want to be your friend anymore. But God would cease to be God if he forgot such things. God sees and remembers what we do and what we say to others. God sees and remembers when we go and work for him. That's what God wants us to do, to continue telling others about his good news, about his son Jesus. 
See, we desire that each one of you show that same diligence as the early disciples. They had that assurance of hope. Do you have that assurance of hope in your daily life? Keep up your good work. Press on with that hope until the end. Imitate those who inherit God's promises. Notice I didn't say that they earned God's promises. They inherited God's promises of eternal life because of the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. And we, got, we do sometimes get discouraged. And when we do get discouraged, as the Hebrew Christians were discouraged, we can easily become sluggish. We can easily just fall back and say, you know what? Nobody's listening anymore. I give up. It's easy to give up. But God does not want us to. The writer to Hebrews encourages us like a coach, pressing us on, saying, work. Continue working. People are listening. Our work is a whole cause of obedience to God. And it's to be done in love. It's a love of intelligence and understanding. It has a purpose. Because when we fully understand God's love for us, that love produces work. It makes us want to go out and tell others. God looks for both love and labor in our lives. John 14 and verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commands. See, true love is active. True love is diligent and untiring. And love is the motive that we should have whenever we go out into the world. No matter who we're talking to, how unlovable that person may be or seem to us, we need to love others. It's not for our self-glory. It's not because, oh, I can pat myself on the back saying, I talked to somebody today. It's not about that. It's about caring for other people so much that you want them to also become part of God's family. Do not become sluggish. Don't get discouraged because that makes us weak. It makes us lazy and unmotivated. It's that kind of attitude that makes us feel like giving up. See, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And so can you. We all need to encourage ourselves in the Lord by praying. Continue to pray for the congregation here. Continue to pray for those you're going to talk to. You can encourage yourself through Bible study. We all need to stay in the Word of God. On a daily basis, not whenever we feel like it or feeling down or, oh, something's wrong in my life, so I guess I'll open up the Bible and see if there's answers there. It's not that way. We are to be daily in the Word of God. We need to encourage ourselves in the Word. We also need to get closer to the body. This is the body. Look around you. This is the body of Christ as we work in our community around us. We need to attend worship more. Not just on Sunday mornings. Not whenever it's convenient. Whenever the door is open, the body needs to gather for encouragement. You may not need that encouragement this week, but maybe somebody else does. They need to see you here so they can talk to you and get encouraged by your words, by your enthusiasm, by your love for them. We need to attend gatherings whenever we can. We also need to be tied more in the work of the congregation. Do you know what the work of this congregation is? Seek out that work and continue it. Workers are few. See, when we do that, then we are encouraged. We easily get encouraged more when we stay busy in the work of God. It is easier to see the bigger picture when we invest ourselves more. And when we invest ourselves more, it leaves less time for discouragement. See, it is not in vain. Hebrews 6 and verse 10 says, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love you have demonstrated for His name, in having served and continuing to serve the saints. We are to continue, even in good times or bad. See, God sees and He remembers what we have done and what we are doing for Him. He even knows our motivations and desires. He looks at our hearts. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. 
always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. The people that you talk to, you're trying to encourage in the world, they may reject it. They may slam that door on you. They may befriend you on Facebook or whatever in other means. But don't get discouraged. God is still working. You are planting that seed. Love God and others so much that you will be a faithful worker. Know that our work here is not worthless. It's not in vain. It's actually the opposite. It's vitally important. It's eternally important because God's desire for us is to be laborers with God. We are working with God. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 8 and 9 says, The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. You are God's building. See, all farming is us working together with God. Did you realize that? We can plant a seed, but we're not going to make it grow. God is the one that makes that seed grow. We are workers in the field of teaching. We are workers with God. Are you teaching others? Are you talking to others? Friending them when they're unfriendly. We sow in the field. We sow in the heart. God is the one that gives the increase. The apostles and the faithful teachers are God's fellow workers, working together with Him, doing and teaching what He directs. Whoever claims to be a Christian, whoever claims to be a disciple or a follower of Christ, should also have and show His love. If you have and show this love, then you will want to work with God for His purposes. He wants us to work in the field of Oahu. He wants us to go out and talk to others and show that love. But many do not know how to work or even what to do. See, it doesn't have to be something that we consider big or major. It doesn't have to be something that we consider important. All work is important. That is why God made us His body. He's given us different talents. Each of us, He's given a talent. He's given us different spheres of influence that only you can reach. He's given us different opportunities. All for the common purpose of glorifying God and leading others to Him. All of our work is one because one job is as necessary as the other. David's job by preaching the word on Sunday morning is no more important than your job Monday through Friday of explaining the Word of God to your co-workers, your fellow classmates, showing the love of God to others. If the grain was not planted, there would be no use in pouring water on it. The work of one is as needful as the other. None of us should undervalue the labors of other people. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 and 7 says, I planted a seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. We plant the seed. We tell others about the good news of God, and then we rely on God to do the rest, to help cultivate the heart to accept that seed, the word of God. Since we work with God, He knows our labors. Revelations 2 and verse 2. The angel was talking to the church in Ephesus when he said, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. See, God knew all about their work. He knows about their labors. And he knows about our labor here at Wellsprings Fellowship. Whether we have done little, whether we have done much, or whether we have done none. So what are we to conclude about this? We are to labor in the cause of Christ until we die. 
Did you know that? There's no retirement plan here on the earth. But the good news is that we're never unemployed. We will never retire here on earth. Revelation 14 and verse 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. See, we will be rewarded according to our faithfulness in doing the will of God. Are you being faithful to God? 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 8 tells us, The one who plants and the one who waters works together with the same purpose. And both will be rewarded for their own hard work. Both will be rewarded. Are you laboring with love for God? See, because of our physical calendar, we all have a great opportunity to set our hearts and our minds on the important things that we need to be doing because of the new year. A lot of people make New Year's resolutions. Do you know that we can do that any time of the year? We can set our hearts and our minds on doing the things of God. Traditionally in the church, 90% of the work gets done by 10% of the people. That's a standard statistic across the board. 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. But I encourage all of us in the body here to change that statistic. Let us all find our place. Let us all find our labor of love here in this body, here at Wellspring, here in Oahu. What is your job for 2014? This is going to be one of our themes for 2014. A job for all. And a job for all. Yeah. We all have a job to do. If you do not know your skills, if you don't know where to start or what needs to be done, all you need to do is ask the leadership team. You know we have a leadership team here, right? I didn't plan this, but uh, if the leadership team that are here today, would you please stand up? Please just stand up to be, uh, be recognized by the, the congregation. If you look around, these are the leadership team that are making the decisions for our congregation. If you don't know what to do for the next year, if you don't know what kind of a job that you can be doing, thank you, ask one of them. They've got a list of things that need to be done in our community, on Oahu, and only in this building. They can put you to work. Find your skills. Everyone has a job to do. Get with the other members and find out what they're working on. Find out what their jobs are in the, in the congregation. Tag along with them to get started. Ask, seek, and you will find the role that needs to be filled here in this body. Let us all work together for the glory of God in Hawaii in 2014. See, this lesson has primarily been directed at those who have already accepted Christ and are, are members of this congregation in order to encourage you to get more involved in the work here. And I hope that you are encouraged by that and you see the need for the work here in Oahu. We all have a job to do. But maybe there are some in the audience who don't know what to do with their lives. Maybe you haven't even accepted Christ on His terms and been adopted by the King. See, we must follow the faith process as outlined in the Bible. We all need to be busy, but first and foremost, we need to be a member of the body of Christ. We need to be a part of the family of God. And in the Bible, it tells us what we need to do. We need to hear the word. We need to believe and repent of our past wrongs. We need to confess and be baptized. See, this is not a, a checklist or a process. This is a this is the process of our hearts that we need to do self-reflection on. And we have to have an open mind, open heart, and an open Bible in order to fully study and understand what God is telling and wants of each of us. Because then he says that we need to live a faithful life, which includes working in love for him. Are you working in love for God? You have a sphere of influence 
that you may not even realize what are you doing with that sphere of influence. God is calling you to use it for His glory, for the church, for God. Whatever your needs today, come forward as together we stand and sing God's song of invitation. <laughs>